Hi, my name is Bryn Boslett, and I am an infectious disease doctor at the University of California, San Francisco. Today I'm going to discuss those skin infections associated with an infected collection, known collectively as purulent skin infections. By the end of this session, you should be able to describe the epidemiology associated with purulent skin infections, name some of the common microbiologic etiologies of these infections, compare and contrast the clinical manifestations of folliculitis, fernunculosis, and abscesses, and to describe the treatment and prevention of these diseases. Purulent skin infections may involve the epidermis, dermis, or hypodermis, along with associated structures such as hair follicles. The single most common inciting organism in skin infections that involve pus is Staph aureus. However, purulent infections can sometimes be caused by other organisms, or they may be polymicrobial, meaning that more than one organism is involved in the infection. Occasionally, patients may have an area of cellulitis near or overlying the purulent infection. In terms of risk factors, there are oftentimes aren't any that can be identified. The prevalence of nasal Staph aureus colonization in the general population is between 20 and 40 percent, but why some carriers develop recurrent skin infections while others do not is pretty unclear. Patients may develop a purulent skin infection after exposure to a close contact, such as a household member or via contact sports. Poor hygiene may also play a role. Finally, immunocompromised patients, injection drug users, and diabetics may develop more serious infections and are also at greater risk of both staph and non-staph skin infections. The term folliculitis refers generally to infection or even simply inflammation of the hair follicles, which leads to erythematous papules or pustules surrounding these follicles. Patients may have a very superficial infection with fragile pustules that open easily, or may have a slightly deeper inflammatory papule or nodule. Staph is the most common cause, often methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA. Gram-negative infections may also occur, particularly with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, in the setting of exposure to inadequately chlorinated pools or hot tubs, known commonly as hot tub folliculitis. Non-bacterial causes of folliculitis are far less common, but might include drug reactions and something called eosinophilic folliculitis, which is a itchy form of folliculitis that is often seen in HIV patients. There are several other infections that can mimic folliculitis, including varicella zoster virus, molluscum contagiosum, and scabies. The diagnosis of folliculitis is typically based on history and clinical exam findings. Further workup with gram stain and culture is only recommended in the setting of treatment failure or when an immunocompromised host in whom the diagnosis is unclear. In terms of treatment, supportive measures may be curative. Patients may be advised to apply warm compresses and avoid shaving in the affected area, leading to resolution over several days. Soaps that contain benzoyl peroxide or other antibiotic washes may be useful as well. If these measures fail to resolve the infection, topical antibiotics are the next line of treatment. Mupiracin, erythromycin, and clindamycin are a few of the recommended agents that are available as ointments. Finally, if the patient has an extensive amount of folliculitis, or if the disease is located in a sensitive area, or the patient's failing to improve with other measures, oral antibiotics can also be used. These antibiotics should be directed towards MRSA, which again is a common cause of this infection. Abscesses and furuncles both represent more deeply seated purulent infections when compared to folliculitis. Abscess is a word that describes a collection of purulent material, typically in the dermis and subcutaneous tissues. However, abscesses may occur anywhere in the body where there is a bacterial infection, such as the liver or the lung. Furuncle is a term used to describe an abscess that involves a hair follicle. The layman term for furuncle is a boil. 
In contrast to folliculitis, which remains largely superficial, furuncles extend down into the dermis and subcutaneous tissue, forming a firm, tender nodule that progresses to an abscess there. Furuncles are most common in areas where moisture from sweat is able to accumulate, such as the groin, neck, axillae, thighs, and buttocks, but they can occur on any hairy skin surface. If the infection spreads to affect multiple neighboring hair follicles, this is called a carbuncle. The larger of collection of lesions may grow together and form interconnecting subcutaneous abscess cavities. Typically, this deep pocket of infection will form one or more draining tracts to the skin surface, referred to as sinus tracts, which are pictured here. Like folliculitis, abscesses and furuncles are typically diagnosed clinically, meaning based on history and exam findings. Treatment varies by severity of the disease. For very small, limited lesions, the application of moist heat several times per day may help the lesion to open and drain spontaneously, after which the skin typically heals and no further treatment is needed. Larger abscesses and furuncles plus almost all carbuncles will require incision and drainage, whereby the lesion is surgically opened and the purulent material is evacuated. A blunt instrument may be inserted into the lesion in order to break up the interconnecting cavities, called loculations, ensuring adequate drainage. Afterwards, the lesion may be packed with gauze or simply covered with gauze. Healing takes place over a few weeks and again, if the lesion is completely drained, antibiotics are typically not required. Occasionally, these purulent skin infections may cause a more severe illness with fevers, chills, and other systemic signs and symptoms. Overlying cellulitis may develop on or around the lesions. This is more common in the case of carbuncles and larger abscesses. In this situation, patients are typically treated with antibiotics in addition to drainage, and depending on how ill they are, hospitalization may also be necessary. Another case in which antibiotics may be indicated is when lesions are located in sensitive areas, such as the face or genitals. Otherwise, antibiotics are typically not necessary for treatment. If you are choosing an antibiotic for empiric coverage, which means that we are still waiting for culture results to return, it is important to cover for MRSA which is estimated to be responsible for up to 50% of these infections. The treatment of MRSA infection could encompass an entire module, but I'll just lay out a few possibilities for outpatient treatment. This pertains to patients who are otherwise clinically well and can take an oral medication for their infection. Prior to choosing one of these medications, you should always keep your local MRSA antibiotic resistance profile in mind. Some areas of the country have strains of MRSA that are very resistant to one or more of these choices, so the best option for your patient may depend on where he or she lives. Finally, there are individual patient factors that must be considered, such as allergies or coexisting medical conditions that might make one regimen more or less ideal than the others. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is one of the first-line oral agents for treating MRSA infection. It is taken twice per day and is generally well tolerated, although higher doses can cause GI upset, such as nausea and vomiting. Unfortunately, this antibiotic does not have reliable coverage against strep species, so it should not be used alone for the treatment of cellulitis. Patients with underlying kidney disease need to be monitored as this drug can cause elevated levels of potassium in these patients. Prolonged courses of this medication can sometimes lead to bone marrow suppression, manifested as thrombocytopenia, meaning low platelets, leukopenia, and anemia. But this is not typical in patients who are on short courses of therapy. Doxycycline is another reasonable oral option for MRSA infection. It is taken twice per day and is also generally well tolerated, although again, it can cause nausea vomiting if taken on an empty stomach. Like trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, it does not have reliable coverage against strep. So again, if you're trying to treat a concomitant cellulitis, you cannot use this drug as monotherapy. 
Some areas of the country are seeing an increase in MRSA resistance to doxycycline, so again, check your susceptibility patterns before prescribing. One common side effect of doxycycline is photosensitivity, and patients should be advised to wear protective clothing and sunscreen while taking this antibiotic. Also, children under age 10 should avoid this medication altogether, as it can lead to teeth discoloration and malformation. Minocycline is in the same family as doxycycline, but MRSA tends to have less resistance to it because it is an agent that is not used as commonly as doxycycline. Unfortunately, one reason that it is used less commonly is that it tends to have more GI side effects than doxycycline. It should similarly be avoided in children because of the teeth effects. Clindamycin is the only drug listed here that can reliably cover both strep and staph species. Unfortunately, in some areas of the country, MRSA resistance to clindamycin has reached over 50%. Clindamycin has also been tied to some unpleasant GI side effects. It is classically associated with causing Clostridium difficile diarrhea, although this connection is not quite as strong as it used to be. As antibiotics like ceftriaxone and the fluoroquinolones have come into more common use, they are now the leading cause of C. diff infection. Recurrent abscess and furuncles occur commonly, especially among close household contacts or in persons who play contact sports. Patients should be encouraged to pay close attention to personal hygiene by bathing frequently and wearing loose clothing or changing clothes frequently if moist. Patients should also be educated to avoid sharing towels, razors, and other toiletries. As mentioned previously, chronic carriage of Staph aureus is associated with disease and decolonization measures may be helpful, especially if more conservative measures have failed. Once patients have had at least one confirmed MRSA skin infection, nasal swab testing to detect and diagnose colonization is generally not required. In several studies, intermittent application of intranasal mupirocin reduced the rate of abscess and furuncle recurrence by as much as 50%. Antiseptic soaps such as chlorhexidine may have some effectiveness in combination with mupirocin, although the data on this is conflicting. If transmission is occurring among household members, it may be beneficial to decolonize the entire household. Thank you for your attention.